Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 311 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So thrilled that you are here today as I am going to answer some questions from my patrons. This is a bonus mini episode, although maybe not so mini because there's a few of them. And I'm just going to treat this like a normal episode without an interview on the end of it. So um, let's hang out for a little while and do that. I have some great questions coming up. And as always, these are courtesy of my patrons at the $5 a month level and up. And if you are at that level, you can ask me any question you want about writing, your writing, the business, the craft, the anything. Um, and I would love to answer them. So I'm going to jump into those in just one minute. But while we're speaking of Patreon, I have some new supporters and I haven't thanked people in a while. So I would like to get to them right now. Um, if you're ever curious about what you can get over there, uh, the most important thing, the thing I love doing is sending out my essays or chapters once a month. And you get advanced uh, distribution of those. And it's something I really take seriously. And I try to give you good stuff. Currently, I'm writing a memoir about moving around the world. So that's what people have been mostly getting. Although this last month, I was so busy that instead I sent the first chapter of my next book. And that was really fun too. People um, seem to enjoy that. So thank you for that. Thank you to new patrons, Paul Worthington. Hello, Paul. Suzanne Dunlap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sarah McCraw Crow. Thank you. Al Clover. Thank you. Jason Poole, my friend who has been on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Miley Topliff, another friend. Thank you, Miley. And another friend friend. These are friends coming in. Joanna Penn. Hello, Joanna. Thank you so much, y'all. That means a ton to me. It always means so much. And your support helps me do this show. It gives me the time to think about it, to get the guests, to talk to the guests, and then to talk to you, which is my favorite part of all. So talking to you, uh, what has been going on around here? Holy crap, so much. Um, I am quite tired, but I delivered my book to my editor. This is Seven Miracles. This is the paranormal women's fiction, uh, which is kind of a, a, a genre that is... I would not say it's exploding, but it's doing well right now. Um, and if you are interested, if you've ever bought any of the K-Lytics uh, reports done by Alex Newton. They're really strong. Alex goes into the nitty gritty data that he can scrape from Amazon to see what's selling, how and how much and what is it making and why and what are the keywords and what are the words in the title. And right now, paranormal midlife women's fiction <laughs> is a thing. And I did not know that there really was a category for the book that I'm writing, but there really is. Uh, it's a 45 year old woman who is leaving her husband um, although that happens at the very beginning of the book, she doesn't know she's going to leave her husband. And then and there's a very sexy woman in the picture, although this is not a romance. It's really a family story of coming together. So knowing that having I paid the whopping price of thirty seven dollars for this report and his reports are really awesome. So that was fun to read through and it's going to help me make cover decisions because he looks at what is happening right now in that genre on covers what's what are the most prevalent covers what are the covers that are making the most money what can we what kind of information can we glean from that and he does this for so many of the different genres out there this particular report i have to say um there was still i don't know 25 percent of my, me that was thinking should i give this book to my agent to try to take out for a bunch of money. And if she doesn't get it, then I will self-publish. The, the report I got from Alex took that 25% away and made me 100% committed to indie publishing this book this year. Because the vast majority, the vast majority, 88% or something like that, um, of the money being made right now in paranormal women's fiction is by self-publishers and I have to, I hate to say this, but I'm, you know, I'm always honest with y'all. It's being made in KU, Kindle Unlimited, which is the subscription service where people pay $9.99 a month and get to read all the books that they want. And then readers are paid on the per page model, which I theoretically hate because Amazon has, and you know this, but just for the, you know, two people listening who don't know this, if you put your books into Kindle Unlimited, which is not putting your books onto Kindle, you can put your books onto Kindle all day long. 
and onto Nook and onto um, Kobo and Apple Books. But if you put them into the Kindle Unlimited program, Amazon has an exclusion, uh, 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 exclusivity, <laughs> exclusion, an exclusivity policy that then your eBooks can't be anywhere else. Your audiobooks and your print books can be, but your eBooks must only be on Amazon, which I hate because I believe Amazon is the devil. And um, however, I, I might choose the devil who pays my bills and try the KU experiment. I have always been wide and I have trumpeted on about being wide. And I believe in being wide. I believe in getting our money as creatives from as many different places as possible, because there is nothing to say that Amazon won't one morning say, we no longer do books or we do books. But now if you sell the book, you're going to make 20% royalty instead of 70%, or we are not going to pay you page reads or the price we're paying, the, the money we're paying you for page reads is going to go down. They're in total control of that. And I never, ever want to put all my eggs in one basket. But I am an experimenter, so I will I will keep you posted. I am going to, oh gosh, I have a feeling this is going to be a long episode today. Settle in, y'all. Um, I have, I, what I'm going to do is sell the book, the audiobook, and the print book direct from my website for one month. So that means I can sell it to anybody, anywhere. And they do not have to purchase from Amazon. In fact, they can have the incredible satisfaction of purchasing directly from me and putting, what is it, 90 to 95% of the money into my own pocket, giving none to Amazon. And then I will put it into Amazon KU and see what happens. I will put up for sale the next book, which I have not written yet, but I will, but I will um, drive some pre-orders that way. And I'm just going to keep you apprised of this entire experiment into this new genre for me. So that's going to be fun, super exciting. And also I'm really proud of the book. I wrote it so fast and I enjoyed every second of it because I have this new system of what I am calling reactive writing, which will be in um, the next book that I write about writing, which hopefully won't be too long away from now. But it really worked for me as an overthinker, an overanalyzer, high intellection in terms of Clifton strengths. This um, this focused me, so that was really really enjoyable, and I loved sending it to my editor. And I also uh, have not had a day off in like three and a half weeks, so I'm looking forward to taking a couple of days off. We're going up to Auckland this weekend to see Orville Peck in concert, which makes me very nervous because of ye olde COVID, um, BA5, which is ramping up here and I don't want to get it, but I will not be working and that will be really fun. So I mean, I am looking forward to that. So that's a catch up of what's been going on around here. Let's jump into these awesome questions. Okay. Uh, the first few come from Penn. Hello, Penn. All right. Number one, how do you stay enthralled in a project long enough to get it done? So multiple layers to this question, I think. So um, it's an excellent question. So many people fight with this actual feeling of, oh, I would say almost almost all writers. I, I, never, I rarely say almost all writers, but almost all writers do fight with the feeling of getting bored of the thing that used to excite them, the project that they are working on. This gets worse for most people, the longer it takes to write the book. So I have always tried to write a first draft as quickly as I can. Because once I write the first draft, I can't, th then at least I have an idea of what I, I want it to be. And then revision becomes interesting to me because I can try to make it be what I wanted it to be. And when I say I write a first draft quickly, sometimes like this last time, it's in five weeks. And sometimes it's a lot longer than that. I am not a fast thinker and I'm not a fast writer, honestly. I'm just really stubborn and I keep going back to it. But for me, how I stay enthralled in a project long enough to get it done is I, number one, I don't, I do not stay enthralled with a project usually long enough to get it done. But I know that this feeling of boredom is false. It's just a lie. It's our brains throwing up fireworks, basically throwing fireworks into the sky, hoping to distract us with the new shiny idea because we have run into some thorny thickets in the writing. And when, when writing becomes hard, when we don't know what we're doing, I truly believe that our brains will send these signals to us that say, oh, it's so boring. I'm bored with writing it. No, you're not bored with writing it. You're confused. It's hard. 
you don't know which way to go. Um, there's more to it than just boredom. Yes, of course, we can get bored with the scenes that we look at over and over and over again. That's normal. That's natural. But feeling less than enthralled with a project often means that we are trying to avoid it because it's difficult. Um, and knowing that, and when I feel bored of a project, I go, oh, okay, what am I trying to avoid here? Um, or oftentimes when I feel less than enthralled, it means I've kind of gone, I've perhaps gone in the wrong direction. And that is a good cue for me to pull back, look at what I put on the page, decide if I keep, want to keep going in that direction. It might just be my gut saying, no, 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 don't do it. You're going the wrong way. Think about this some more. You can't let yourself think for forever that um, thinking looping will get fired up and then we have to make decisions and we have to keep moving forward. But in order to stay enthralled, I'm, I choose to make myself enthralled by when I do get bored, I ask myself if I've gone the wrong direction and if I don't think I've gone the wrong direction or if I just can't tell, which is often the case, I point myself in the direction of the next thing that excites me to write. And I skip over everything else. All the things I know I need to write, I skip them if I don't want to write them, and I go to the next part that sounds fun for me to write, even if I need to make it something that I don't even think fits in the book. Like everything in this book has been boring to me. So I am going to add a nuclear explosion in this book about, in this quiet book about family in a small town. I never thought there was going to be a nuclear explosion. Does that sound fun for me to write? Yes, go write it. Go shake yourself up and it may stick, it may stay, it may change the book pivotally, but always move toward something that excites you. And for me, that means sitting down, jotting a few notes until I, I can't just sit and think. Nothing happens when I sit and think. I just could think all day, all day, all day, all day. That's all I want to do is think. I have to write things down and capture them and then react to what I've written down and think from there and get new ideas. My new ideas come in the act of sitting down and writing and capturing new ideas, even if that's just journaling. Long answer to that short question. I'll try to do better on the next one. Uh, number two, how do you survive the energy slash obsession dips between projects? Ooh. Um, I don't, I don't know because I don't know if I have, <laughs> I don't know if I have energy slash obsession dips, uh, because usually my obsession and my energy is always on, is always waxing. It's always going toward something and I'm getting excited about something new. And that's just a personality type of mine. So in between projects, like right now, I sent off a book on Monday and I need to start editing something else this next week. So in this week, I'm like, what can I do on this next project? I am, I am fiddling with here and I get really excited about it. When I do have actual energy dips and that can come during the writing or between projects, um, I kind of try to honor that. I do try to give myself a little bit more space, a lot more reading time. Um, for me, it's less social media and more reading. And that will always, always, always fuel me and put me back into an energy state. Um, and if I can't find something that I'm loving reading, I don't make myself read stuff that I am not super excited about. Also, I will just read, sometimes I'll read 20 or 25 sample chapters of things until I find the next book that I can't put down. I always want to have a book that's feeding me energy that I can't put down. And I say this because really recently I've kind of been on a, uh, had a couple of really great books that I read a couple of weeks ago. And since then I've been a little bit dry. And, and last night I just blew through some sample chapters until I found something that um, set my hair on fire, which was Catherine Schultz's memoir, Lost and Found, which is so good. It's so good. It's, um, it's quite, it's quite slow and dense, but I, I'm finding it really beautiful. So that is how I help my energy dips. I do, I, I try to respect them as much as I can, but I am also an energizer bunny. And I know that that is annoying. So um, yes. Uh, can number three, can you think of any authors slash creators whose success depends on variety of genre, style, and audience? I was thinking about this pen and I know that listeners are going to have a better answer than me, but I don't know very many of them. Nora Roberts um, writes as J.D. Robb. So she writes romance and thriller, suspense. Um, and her audiences don't always cross over. The romance readers always read all the thrillers, but the thriller readers don't always read all the romances. 
does her success depend upon that? I don't think it does because she could have just done romance or just done thriller and been, you know, millions and millions zillionaire from that. But I, I honestly believe, and I don't like this, but I honestly believe that when we do write in different genres and different styles and collect different audiences, um, that is usually a detriment to our success. And that's, and that can be okay. That can absolutely be okay. Look at um, Elizabeth Gilbert. She writes fiction and memoir and her memoir readers generally don't cross over into her fiction, but I bet her fiction readers might cross over into her memoir. That's just a guess on my part. And writing fiction for her does not increase the monumental success that she has had as a memoirist but it's what she has to do. It's what she loves. So um, if somebody can think of somebody who does many, many things in different genres, I mean, I'm thinking of, um, <laughs> I was going to say Bjork, you know, as a musician who does a lot of things, but Bjork, but Bjork's style is very much Bjork's style. So if you are a Bjork fan, you're going to go along with anything that she does. Um, but even musicians really struggle with that. You know, if they're a country artist, I mean, how hard did Taylor Swift have to work to move from country into pop? And she's kind of the Nora Roberts, right? She can do anything and still, and, and, but she had, she fought that. She had a real hard time with that for a long time. So I don't know. I don't know if success is ever aided by variety of genre or style or audience, but I absolutely could be wrong. So I would love if anybody has a, has an idea on that or can, or can provide some, um, some names that I would be excited to think about. Okay. Last question from Penn. What is your favorite ice cream flavor and why? Oh, that's easy. It used to be chocolate peanut butter in the States because chocolate and peanut butter, that's the answer. Um, but in New Zealand, it is hands down hokey pokey, which is the New Zealand ice cream of New Zealand. Every, I'm, I won't say every, but I'm going to say almost every Kiwi loves hokey pokey ice cream. It is the best ice cream ever invented. Uh, New Zealanders eat more ice cream, ice cream per capita than any other nation in the world. They eat it morning, noon, and night. You will see them in the middle of winter standing on a sidewalk holding an ice cream cone. Like right now, people are just eating ice cream downtown at this moment. It's like 45 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside. Hokey pokey is um, van really good vanilla ice cream with what are hokey pokey? Um, it's like a, a toffee, um, honeycomb. It's a honeycomb toffee. So it's crunchy candy, honeycomb toffee inside the vanilla. And there's some, there's some crappy cheap stuff, but the deep South hokey pokey mm, can't, you can't do better. You can't do better than that. Thank you, Penn, for those awesome questions. Uh, David Drysdale says, hi, Rachel. I really, really love your podcast. And I have a coaching question for you. Well, thank you. I started writing last year. I spent a long time trying to write a good first draft before all the good advice about a dra garbage draft really sunk in. And I managed to finish draft number one. Yay! It's messy. It's rough. But it's technically a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now it's come time to revise and I'm frozen. When I look at my draft, it's just so, so bad. I think there's a kernel of a story there somewhere, but when I read what I wrote, I'm not seeing the story I wanted to tell. I had this idea in my head for how I wanted the story to feel, but I don't think it's anywhere close. I don't think I have an arc for my protagonist. I don't think I have a strong structure. And worst of all, I just don't know if it's an interesting story. So revising, it feels like starting over. And because of that, I feel frozen. I tried writing from a different position to the narrative and from a different point of view, but I just don't know how to get through this without basically just writing another garbage draft help. So David, I love this question. And if you have not listened to episode number 108 of this podcast, how do you write episode 108? It's called, I think it's called Rachel on revision. Um, I recommend that you go check that out because I really do give most of my tips and tricks for revision in there. Um, but I'm just going to give you the, the, the briefest overview of this. I'm going to do this in two minutes. And this is literally what I spend 90 days of the 90 day revision class teaching. Um, 
what I advise that you do is write a sentence outline, which is basically a list of things that happen in the scenes that are in the book so that you can look at the entire book and read it in just, you know, three or four minutes. There's just a few words per scene. And then make sure that you know where the turning points are in the book. It sounds like you already know about story structure because uh, you're worried that if you you're worried if you have it correct and believe me in a first draft that is always an, a gigantic worry. So look for the inciting incident. Look for the midpoint that has some kind of context shift to it. Look for the dark moment. Um, make yourself notes about each scene and what you might like to do to increase the pace or increase the tension or decrease the tension or um, cut it entirely. What could fit in there instead? Make yourself notes about what might be added. But here's the important thing is when you're looking at that crappy first draft, knowing that the book's going to get really good in about the third draft, and you can look forward to that. The second draft, and I call it the big makes sense draft. In the second draft, all you are trying to do is put what happens and how the character changes in approximately the right places. So when you are worried about writing another garbage draft, I'm going to tell you, the second draft often feels like, and it could be argued to be, an, a garbage draft. You absolutely, what you want to avoid most of all in revising in the second draft is making the words on the page good. If you make the words on the page good, if you make the paragraphs beautiful, if you make the chapters strong with um, good description and dialogue and action all and wonderful language, um, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because then you will not be able to see what needs to go, what needs to move, what isn't strong enough. Um, the second draft, try to think about it as just a putting things into the right areas move the things to the right areas. And then in the third draft, which I just, I think is just like the most fun of all, then you go through because everything's in the right place. Now you get to make things awesome, really, really strong and awesome. But do consider the second draft just another garbage draft. It's, you would not show this to anyone. You would not let it leave your desk. The third draft is going to be a lot faster than the second draft. Um, be kind to yourself. You do not need to, unless you want to, but you don't need to try to write from a different position to the narrative or from a different point of view, your book just feels clumsy and awkward and uncomfortable because it is clumsy and awkward and uncomfortable. And that's what it's supposed to be. That's his job right now. So go through and mechanically think about how you can move scenes around. If you want to move scenes around, what you can add to them, how you can make them better, how you can make them fit the structure better and tell a stronger story just by going up to that 30,000 foot bird's eye view and looking down at the sentence outline and making those decisions on paper or, you know, on the, on the computer screen. But, um, a lot of times I kind of combine the both. I, I use a spreadsheet and then I print it out and I scribble all over it because we're using different parts of our brains and bodies to, literally to do work like that. So I hope that that helps, but please feel confident that, um, if you don't know what you're doing and it feels really hard, hard, so difficult. That's because you don't know what you're doing. None of us do when we start working on a second draft. It's just always a mystery to all of us. And it's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. And we do it anyway. And that is where we start to find the magic of the book. We start to know what the book wants is in that big second make sense draft. And I know you can do it. Keep me posted. All right. Jessica says, uh, I have a coaching question as a brand new baby writer. The first book I'm working with an editor on self pub is a mystery in a fantasy setting. My editor said I needed more of my villain. I agree and have been working on new scenes for him for several months, but how do I show the real him without revealing he is the big bad? Also, I don't know how to show the murder without giving it away too soon. Thanks for your help. Good question. Hard question, Jessica. That sounds, that sounds difficult. Um, I am going to assume because of your wording that you might be writing from the point of view of the villain within the book? Is that true? If you are writing from the point of view, so you're inside the head of the villain, it's going to be very, very difficult to show the real him without revealing that he is the big bad guy. Um, because if we are in the point of view of someone who is not telling the reader the truth in his own thoughts that we are able to overhear because we are in their point of view, it can be seen as kind of a, a like, I don't want to call it a cheap trick, but it's not, it's not reasonable. It's not, it doesn't, 
a reader could get upset that that would not be reasonable, that if we're in the point of view of the big bad antagonist, that we wouldn't occasionally hear about what they're planning to do next. That's very evil. Or a thought would flit through their mind about what the blood looked like on the knife, right? So, and if we're in a point of view, we do, I mean, we can have unreliable narrators, but an unreliable narrator is different from an author hiding things from a reader inside a point of view. So and I, that would be a big trick to pull off. And if that is what you're doing, I would recommend that you go back to the editor and say, this is what I want to do. And I don't know how to do it. Can you give me some pointers on how you might do that. If, however, you're trying to write more scenes um, with the villain in them, which is what I'm hoping you're doing, because that would be a lot easier. So you're in somebody else's point of view, but the villain is often in these scenes. Um, number one, thank goodness that'll be that'll be easier. And number two, what you do is you try to just you don't you don't need to make them seem bad or good, but you want to make this person seem as complex as anybody else on the page. Readers brains love to puzzle things out. So if there is a puzzle in the book of any sort, and if we've got a murder in there and it's a mystery, then the reader's already primed to start puzzling. So anybody who walks onto the page, the reader is going to say, Ooh, could it be, could it be that person? And sometimes we can play with the reader by showing that person to be so annoying or mildly or majorly evil on the page that the reader goes, Oh, that is such a bad person that I bet that's not the, that's not the bad guy. It can't be the bad guy. I bet it's the good person. And then if you put, um, if you give that actual villain really awesome traits, super awesome traits, like, you know, he saves kittens out of trees and volunteers at the soup kitchen, um, the reader then might think, okay, this person is so good that they have to be the bad guy. So playing with what the reader is thinking about is super fun by making them complex, make them a little bit of a crappy person. and a little bit of an awesome person. And you want to do that with the other characters, the other red herrings that you're trying to fool people into thinking it might be as well. So you're always kind of constantly playing with the reader's expectations. Like, I think it's that person. No, it can't be that person, but it could be that person. Wait, no, it's got to be that one. And we do that by making them interesting. And we do that in revisions because oftentimes characters, especially in crime novels, land on the page a little bit flat, and then we have to add that in. Um, so when your editor said you needed more of your villain, perhaps you need a little bit more, but maybe you don't need a lot more. Uh, maybe what they are looking for, what your editor was looking for, is a little bit more complexity, if that makes sense. That will make the villain character just appear bigger and richer in the story. Um, on the second question, also, I don't know how to show the murder without giving it away too soon. That one I don't know how to answer because... Um, if it's a cozy murder, if it's, sorry, if it's a cozy murder, cozy mystery, then the first murder usually happens within the first chapter or two. Um, if it's a different kind of crime novel, of course, the murder or murders can happen anywhere. So I don't, I don't actually know how to answer that one without um, more information. Uh, but remember that if you're writing a mystery, your readers are there for the mystery. They want to read it. So um, show that murder as best you can while hiding what you need to. And the way we do that is by showing them things, showing the reader things that we're going to convince them that they think they want to see while not showing the things that we are trying to hide from them. And I know that that sounds really easy when it comes out of my mouth and it's not easy to do on the page. And that is something that is um, best done in a second draft or a third draft. If it is too obvious, as it often is in a first draft, we go back and pull out the parts that made it obvious and and put in our own little red herring plot kind of things around the things that we need to throw up a little obfuscation around, um, disguise it a little bit. Does that make sense? Okay, great question. Thank you, Jessica. And so exciting. Have fun with this. Um, that sounds really, really fun. Okay. And then Dina has a question here. I love this. Um, okay, my questions. As you know, I'm in Deep, I'm deep in revision of a memoir about finding out I'm pregnant at 16, two months after being dumped by my high school sweetheart and facing the biggest decision of my life to keep, get rid of, or give away my baby, a baby that I deliberately created. 
There are a couple of sex scenes in the manuscript, but when I try to revise these scenes, I get stuck. I want to be sensitive that I'm writing about sex between two minors, age 14 and 16 in an early scene and ages 16 and 18 in a later scene. How much is too much when writing romance between minors? My ideal reader will be adult woman. However, I'm beginning to think my book may be a good fit for young adult. Such a good and complex question. Um, but here is the... Here's, here's what I, here's what my answer is. I honestly think you can trust yourself to do this well and as sensitively as you need to, which doesn't actually need to be that sensitive. Young adults know about sex. They've heard about it. They've done it. They've seen it on the page. You get to show it the way that honors your memoir and what happened in it. Um, and of course, adult women will understand what is going on. The whole premise of your book is being too young to really handle any of this, any of that stuff in an adult way. So the fact that this young person, this 14 year old, and then the 16 year old, a couple of years later, we already know that they're handling it, that, that you as the character on the page were handling it in the manner of a 14 year old girl and in the manner of a 16 year old girl. The only place that you could go wrong here, I think, is by um, gratuitously showing it as, you know, sexy times with the, you know, beautiful lighting and candlelight and trying to, to, even if, even if candles were burning at the time and beautiful music is playing and you're showing that on the page, the tone of it, you're not going to be objectifying this young girl as a sexual being, and you're not going to be objectifying this young man as a sexual being. You're going to be showing them trying to do an adult thing as a child. And you can't, you're not going to make that sexy. You know what I mean? Um, it might be sweet and it might be, or it might be painful and awkward. It might even be beautiful. But you're not going to be sexualizing either you or the guy. Does that make sense? This is not going to be erotica. I'm trying to think of a case in which it could be, but I don't, I just, I think you're actually actively trying to avoid that. So I just, I just don't think you are going to stray into that territory. The fact that you've had the thought is great. And whatever editor you end up working with will help you with that. And I know I say that a lot, um, but it's very true. And they will let you know if it's problematic at all, but trust your gut on this. I, I know that you're already doing it the right way and um, you are in one of my classes. So if you want to send me one of those scenes for your hot seat, um, I will also help you think about that. But but yeah, I trust you in this completely. Uh, number two, are there ever exceptions to the rule that you should have a completed slash clean memoir manuscript prior to querying agents? Since my memoir is so timely, given all the Roe v. Wade stuff happening in the world right now, it feels like the perfect opportunity to strike while the iron is hot. Yet I know that my manuscript still has a lot of work to do before it's ready for outside eyes. Occasionally, I've heard authors say that they exaggerated about their manuscript's readiness when they queried agents, and the surprise of having an agent choose to represent them was the fuel they needed to finally fi finish their writing slash revisions. As you know, I've been working on this manuscript for a long time, about four years. Perhaps the external pressure slash support would help me finally get this project wrapped up and ready to go out in the world. Thanks so much for all that you do. Um, Dina, yes, I love this question. And there are exceptions. And I am just going to tell you that you are one of them. You are an exception to that rule of having your book as good as it possibly can be before you attempt to query an agent. You've been working on this for a long time. I know you're writing. It is good. It is strong. It is already clean. Even if you don't feel like the book is totally ready for prime time, I know you. I know you're writing. It is ready to query. And an agent will never, um, I, I try not to say never, but an agent will usually not offer representation if they haven't read the whole draft. If they read the whole draft, and they see that it has issues, guess what? If they want to represent it, they still want to represent it and they will help you edit it. Your manuscript is in good enough shape for that right now, today. However, I will say that if you were to query and get agent requests for part a partial, say, say this agent, say this agent name, uh, Susan, 
sends you a request for a partial of your manuscript. You're going to send her the first three chapters or whatever it is she specifies that she wants. And you know that you're going to spend the whole night before making sure those are the best three chapters you've ever done that are, that are perfect. You're looking at them for the zillionth time and sending them out. And so she gets back to you in a week and says, oh, I really enjoyed that. I'd like to see the full. I absolutely know that you are not going to sleep for the next three to five days as you work around the clock in all free time, including sleeping time, to make the book as good as you can before you send her the full. And that is fantastic. What a way to go, honestly. And you wouldn't even have to do that. I really honestly believe that you could send it as it is now and the agent would see the potential in it. I do believe that this memoir is timely. I do believe that um, it's a great time to do it. So I am going to encourage you to, yes, start querying, start querying and keep me posted as to how it goes. I think that that external pressure will help you. And that is super exciting. So keep me posted. Uh, okay. And this is a question from Karen, which is, um, you know how I always tell you, y'all can ask me questions about anything. It doesn't have to be writing related. Um, and this is, uh, so here's, here's the question. Con uh, she says, congratulations on seeing your book in airports. Did I say this was from Karen? This is from my friend, Karen. And on your successful book launch party. Um, do you have any tips on making a successful long distance move? I'm planning on moving out of California in the next couple of months. With the skyrocketing costs, my rent is going way up, feeling guilty every time I turn on the water because of the drought and wildfire fires from my office windows. Watch the smoke of the fifth one in our area in the last two weeks. I'm done with California and the West Coast. I don't know where I'm going yet or how I'm going to support myself. I wish I had some place school to move to like New Zealand, but I'm probably going back to New England. I'm wondering if you have any tips since you mentioned you're something of a packing queen in addition to having successfully moved recently. I really want to be already settled into a new place. The thought of packing, finding a place to live and finding a new job exhausts me, but I feel as if I'm ossifying here and if, and if I don't get out now, I'll forever live this gray life of unfulfilled longing. Anyway, any advice you'd have would be greatly appreciated. Isn't that gorgeous? On that gray life of unfulfilled longing. Hello, writer. Um, Karen is a beautiful writer, by the way. I have read her work. Uh, so yes, my my only biggest tip for this is to get rid of as much as you possibly can. We had this awesome problem that turned out to be really great that um, we each got two large suitcases and we could take those with us for the first three to six months that we were here as the rest of our stuff was put into a shipping container and moved across the world on a ship. We didn't know exactly how long it would take to get here. Um, but we had to make these decisions like, uh, does it go with me right now? You know, that's when I would take my Alpha Smart Neo. Yes, that's going with me. Even though I'm not working on, with it right now, I may be typing on it soon. And that goes in the suitcase. But if I put the Alpha Smart Neo in the suitcase, then that's one less pair of jeans. So we really had to restrict ourselves to what we would have in the next three to six months. And then what we took was so limited. We just took, it ended up being two pallets worth of um, boxes that were, it was about 70 or 75 boxes, the small book size boxes, most of them, uh, many of them had books, um, but we did keep some kitchen stuff and, you know, tchotchkes that were important to us and photographs, but we really got rid of everything else. And here's the thing. I don't miss anything. There is nothing that I, oh yes, there's one thing. There's one thing that I wish I had brought. Um, it was that cheap metal black and white speckled pot that you buy like at the grocery stores, they sell them. Um, even though you use them over and over again for, for roasting a chicken in. It took me months to be able to find one of those. I don't know why I just didn't throw it in with the kitchen stuff. I have no idea because at, in the States, it was like $10 at Safeway to buy one of those. And I just thought I would buy another one here, um, but they don't sell them. So I regretted not bringing that. But everything else that I had a hard time getting rid of, and I got rid of so much sentimental stuff, but sentimental stuff that I didn't need to have around all the time. I got rid of my... The stacks and stacks of my mother's piano music, you know, stacks of her, uh, the, the books that she would play the piano from. I kept 
I think I kept three of her piano books, the ones that I can actually play from, the ones that mean something. This, uh, uh, this book of German folk songs that her um, boyfriend at the time when she lived in Germany wrote a love letter to her in the, on the front on the front page. And, uh, and I really like playing the piano from that book. They're simple folk tunes, but I got rid of all those other, you know, Mozart and Haydn and Chopin. I can't play that. I am 40. Wait, I'm not 49. I am 50 years old now as of last week. Um, and I'm not going to learn how to play the piano for those things. And, and like, I, so I was, I, and I didn't want to take the space on the boat. We only, we could not afford to take more than those few boxes because it was so cost prohibitive to move across the country. So this would be my advice on any kind of anywhere move, act as if you are going around the world and give yourself an arbitrary space limitation. Say that you're going to take 50 boxes or hundred boxes or whatever it is that you don't want to take more of. And then once you fill them up, then you start to have to make those decisions. What is, what am I going to take out in order to take this? And the less you take with you, the easier it will be. Um, also taking your time doing it. I love that you're thinking about it now uh, because it is super exhausting. And there were definitely times when we were doing it that I thought to myself, I can't do this. I can't, I give up. Um, this is harder than I ever thought it would be. And I, I can't, and I, and I rarely think I can't because I'm a stubborn mule, um, so it's just hard. So give yourself time and space and think of the deliciousness of someday unpacking into a perfectly clean space where you can put everything exactly where you want it to be um, and the and the joy that you will feel then. Um, however, going back to you know this idea that I talk about about goals all the time, and this applies directly to writing, whenever we are doing anything with an end goal that will bring us supposed happiness, right? Um, if, and this is something I thought about a lot when we were moving, we were moving around the world because the end goal in my head was being in a happier, safer place that I felt better living in. But if the action of achieving that goal makes me miserable the whole time, then I'm not going to complete it. I'm not going to finish it. I'm not going to do it. So that because it kind of negates the, the desired outcome in my heart. So I had to work out a way to enjoy the process along the way. And sometimes I managed it and sometimes I didn't. Um, and it's exactly the same way with writing. If we have the goal to be published and that will bring us happiness someday, that's what we want. We think that that will bring us happiness, um, which by the way, it won't, it will bring you five or 10 minutes of happiness. Um, but the process is so awful and terrible and laborious and, and tricky and difficult, um, then most people will give up. Knowing that doing the work and choosing to do the work and choosing to live inside the moment of doing the work and not always finding it fun because it's not always going to be fun, but knowing that that is the important part, not the end goal. And I know I am literally saying it is the, it's, it's not the, what is it? It's not the destination. It's the journey that matters, but it's actually true because getting to the place of being published won't make you happy. Getting to be the place, getting to bestselling status will not make you happy. Getting to be a millionaire as a, as a bestselling author will not make you happy. It's every single moment. It's the chair we are all sitting in or where we're standing right now that matters on our way to whatever that goal may be. And the goal can be anything. We can move that goal around any time, um, but making sure we pay attention to the now. So as you are thinking, Karen, about possibly moving, um, maybe make a list of the things that do delight you about this idea and what you will enjoy doing and how you will, um, fill a box, what you would love most to put into it, what you could live without for a while. Um, how much time do you want it to take? And then give yourself some buffer time and get excited about 
the newness. And yes, it is stressful. So take your time, take your time, take your time, but also live in the moment of actually doing the work and give yourself plenty of rewards, just like we do as writers, plenty of rewards. As soon as we do something, we get a reward. Um, I'm going to post this podcast in a moment, and then I'm going to go make another cup of tea because I love tea. And that's my reward for, for this little thing that I am doing. This part is enjoyable, the whole uploading and formatting and all of that is not always enjoyable. So I will reward myself for that. And um, yeah, I think I've waffled on about that long enough. But for all of the big goals, let me just say for all of the big goals, be brave, take your time, find the things that delight you and be okay with being in the middle of the process because the goal doesn't matter as much as we think it does. Um, but the process is the place where we can find the deepest and richest uh, sense of accomplishment is what I want to say and what I truly believe. So thank you for that awesome question. Thank you for all of these questions. Look at this is um, already like what, 45 minutes. So I'm going to stop talking. Please, I wish you happy writing. If you would like to go look at Patreon, that's over at patreon.com slash Rachel, and you can join and I can answer your questions and waffle on at you. So um, happy writing to all of you, my friends, and thank you for being here so much.